if your book is hard to read, and we have had some problems with that, uh, I have some extra books, and I'll just switch it out with one that might be printed better. Y'all's look great here. We have had some really poorly copied, and uh, and then also if it's just a page or two, you could go up at the break and they'll or at the end of the class and get a copy made for you from another uh, booklet that looks better. Okay, let's talk about what you do, and I've called you medication text. What you do, and it's along the line is this, of the certified. The only difference between you and certified is that they take a 40-hour to 50-hour class, which includes 10 hours of lab and 10 hours of clinical, and they have to take a test by the state that um, gives them a certification. That's something you may be doing in the future, but right now they had to have everybody with some type of training, so we have a smaller class of, of CMAs and a huge class of people to get through in a 12-hour time or 16 with your lab or your clinical. So what are you to do? What is authorized? What is okay to do as a, as a medication tech? You can deliver, which means administer medications which have been ordered by a physician um, to residents who self-administer, and a lot of yours do self-administer. Do you just go by them periodically to see if they've been taking their medicine correctly by what's in their blister packs? Do we, how many of you work in community homes? Or how many of you work with uh, supported independent living? So most of you are supported independent living. So I know then that those persons do a lot of their medications all by themselves, right? And you just monitor and see that they have been taking them correctly out of the blister pack as far as you can see. But they have to have been ordered by a physician or dentist or a podiatrist or whomever. <clears throat> or you could actually administer that medication if some of you are in community homes. You, according to the guidelines that have been introduced for this, for supported independent living, they want this to be supervised by an RN. That has not been, it needs to be delegated. That has not really been totally worked out here at VOA. Uh, at this point, you're supervised by your supervisor. So if there is a problem with medications, who do you call? Your supervisor. And the supervisor may talk to the pharmacist, may tell you to talk to the pharmacist. I work in community homes. I've worked at VOA, Seabark, Evergreen, other private facilities. Now I'm just doing some homes for Evergreen. When they have a problem, they call me. But believe it or not, they call the supervisor first. That is, they, they just feel very connected to their supervisor. And they usually call them and they call me. Usually the supervisor says, call Dottie. <clears throat> so they do. Now sometimes I tell them, or the supervisor does, to call the pharmacist. Because the pharmacist is one of your best connections to what's going on. If you have a question, because have you ever had a medication come in and it looks different than the time before? Maybe a different color, maybe a little bit different size, different shape. That can happen because they're using a new generic pill. And they should be writing on there what it looks like. Uh, but not all pharmacies, and we all here use sterling. And it depends uh, pretty much, don't we? Or do some of yours get your, their meds like at Walgreens or something? Okay, pretty much they go sterling. And the good thing about that is it's unit dose. It's every dose in a blister pack. So therefore, they should take their medicine correctly if they just push out that day's dose, correct? Mm -hmm. <coughs> all right. So that is a, a safeguard that's a really good safeguard for them and for you. It's easier to determine. But anyway, my point was up here with if you have a question, you have to question it. And you will report to your supervisor. If um, a nurse is hired and they're telling me will be, then uh, that will be another place that you can call to tell somebody what's going on. You are only to administer oral meds. Now, 
enemas and douches are in here, but actually I should probably take it out of this because we don't even have the CMAs do that. We have some training on that, um, but your residents would do it on their own anyway if you're just supervising. But there are some disadvantages of that, some uh, problems with the safety of administering that, that we as a policy for VOA pretty much say, you're not going to do that. Okay, but you will administer oral medicines, ointments, suppositories, even those are also introduced into the rectum of the vagina. That is something that you need to know about, and we will talk about it before the end of this class. Unless, unless otherwise indicated, which is otherwise indicated for those intimacy issues. You will be recording along with the resident, and you'll be administering or monitoring the administration of PRNs. Am I using a term that y'all haven't you heard the PRN, or you use that also? A PRN is the as-needed medicines. They're the, <clears throat> often we say they're the over-the-counter, they're the Tylenols, the ibuprofens, but they have to have an order for that PRN. I've had calls before from my community homes and they'll say, they've really got a bad runny nose and their head hurts and it's really looking like they've bitten by a cold. And I think, um, oh shoot, <laughs> road retrieval is a problem as you get old. I think, uh, let's just say, uh, uh, Mucinex would be best for them to take. Well, that might be best for them to take, but we don't have an order for that. It has to be something that we have an order for, for them. They can take, and the reason that is, and we'll learn about it as we move along more, the reason is that that medication may not be good for something else that they're taking. And so the physician has made the decision. For instance, if they're on blood pressure medicines, they can't just take anything with a decongestant in it because that decongestant will elevate their blood pressure and here we're trying to give them a blood pressure medicine. So we cannot just arbitrarily <clears throat> say, and this is a problem <clears throat> sometimes because the resident will go out and buy it. And so you come and they're saying, I'm taking uh, this medication and you have to look at it and say, we need to be sure this is okay with your doctor. And that can be done. That can be you can talk to your supervisor, you can get a call into the doctor, the supervisor will or may have you do that, and you can get the physician to say, yes, they can have that. But you can't take an order. <clears throat> so let's go on to the next page. Yes. Um, do any of the, <coughs> some clients have standing orders for physicians? That's what a PRN is. So if they have the standing mm -hmm. orders, then? Yes. Okay. The question is, if there's a standing order, which is what that is, for a PRN. That is not a routine order. Your routine orders are your regular daily medications. A standing order is the as needed medications. So that means they, there's nothing that they're supposed to be taking in any fashion, orally, topically, vaginally, anything that they're supposed to be taking that's not on a physician's order. And you are monitoring it. So you need to know what it is they're doing. Now, what you cannot do, besides do something they're not supposed to have, is you cannot get medicine, medicines that are given by shots. In the muscle, in the vein, in the fat, at sub Q, or in a feeding tube. <clears throat> now, we have a few residents now and again that are living in supported independent living or living at home and we're assisting that do have feeding tubes. And if that's something that you come across, then we'll talk about that individually. <clears throat> Things can be done just like they're done in the school system if you have had some written training on it and the physician says it's okay for you to work with that. The same way if you have a resident that's taking insulin sub-Q, that SQ, does anyone have residents that take insulin? We do have some in the other classes. The resident is essentially taking their own insulin, but you're monitoring it, and supposedly 
and according to what they've said you can do, you can't monitor that. And so what we have to do then is if they're self-administering, uh, that's one help, but then we have to let the physician know and the physician will then say you can monitor that. The physician doesn't want to say all of you can monitor whatever. They don't want to do that. That's too broad, isn't it? So, but a one-on-one -on -one monitoring can be done. Okay. You may not administer anything inhaled, like with oxygen, unless what's put into that container is pre-measured. So the little things that we do with the puffs, those are pre-measured. So those are okay. Those are inhalants, but they're okay. But if it's connected to oxygen and you're pouring it into a little bottle there that's going, the uh, oxygen's going through it and into their lungs, and you have to make a decision about how much, you can't do that. But if it's pre-measured, you could. Uh, you may not receive or assume responsibility for reducing to writing an oral or telephone order. What that means is you cannot take a verbal order and be happy that you can't. Mm -hmm. I don't like to do that. It'll show, we'll see in your book where it shows that there are a lot of medicines that sound alike. And you don't want to have to hear from the physician, even the letters, was that a D or a C? You know, when they try to spell it. So, what can you do? can you do tell the doctor if they call if the doctor's office calls and says hold that diphenhydramine today but start it again tomorrow facts and order, facts and order. <laughs> you can say and you'd have to do this everything you do has to be a professional type of communication I'm sorry but I cannot take a verbal order but I can uh, follow that order if you'll fax it to the office and the number is. So see you're not saying I can't do that. You're saying I can't do that but would you fax that into the office and this is the number. They're not going to be happy if they have to look up the number, if they have to figure out how they're going to get it to you. But if you tell them that, they're very willing to follow what it is you need. It may be that they're calling and saying the urine specimen did have bacteria and they do have a urinary tract infection. So we need to start them on some Bactrim DS, uh, 500 milligrams, three, three times a day. No, you don't want to know that. You say, thank you, I'm, I appreciate that information, but would you please fax that order to Sterling? I cannot take the order over the phone, but if you'll fax it to Sterling and the number is, can you see how they would follow suit with that? and gets you off the hook. There are some gotchas, like that diphenhydramine I just said. Hold it today, start again tomorrow. Your, super, your uh, manager comes in and he says, the doctor said to hold that today, start again tomorrow. No, where is that in writing? Because everything you do has to have something in writing to verify that you're to do it. So you can't receive an order. Believe me, y'all, the rest of this after these first two slides is in your book. <laughs> it didn't occur to me to put these two slides in there. I'm sorry. Um, you may not alter the medicine. Now, this can be anything from cutting it in half to crushing it. If you have a, an order and your client is receiving two and a half pills, the blister pack has two and a half pills, doesn't it? Okay. It doesn't have just a bunch of ones and you have to take out two, three, cut one and a half. Give, no, it's all a dose and you are not to reduce it. That's another one of the gotchas. That's one when they say the Coumadin, his blood level, his prothrombin level was a little bit high so I want you to uh, stop a Coumadin, uh, half of it today and then go back tomorrow. And so we have to cut this in half. No. Uh, same kind of scenario, call the pharmacy, the pharmacy will give you the dose you need. <coughs> and they will do it right away. Now you may not see them do things right away, but you may not have had something that had to be done right away. 
and then you talk to your supervisor who probably has made that phone call anyway and y'all work it out as to when the dose is coming in and taking it all of that kind of stuff. You are not to alter the dosages. That means you're a pharmacist and you're not a pharmacist. And pharmacists get mad. <laughs> may not administer medications in an acute care facility. You remember when Northwest State School used to have a hospital as part of it, a kind of a little hospital? That's an acute care facility, and hospitals acute care. Um, a nursing home rehab situation could be acute care. You're not getting uh, any, in any way trained to go to an acute care facility and give medicines. We are gonna see that one day in our nursing homes as you will be the kind of people that will be giving the medications as far as you won't be licensed. You may just be certified. But at this point, that is not correct. We are considered an intermediate care facility, and this is the only one under the Department of Health and Hospitals that you can administer medicines. You may not administer any medication when there's an indication that the medication is inappropriately dispensed, has the wrong medicine has been put in that blister pack. If you, if you see something that's a different color, shape, size, and you wonder, now why is this blue? Then you, and you say, well, it says it's so-and-so, you still call and question it unless they have given you the explanation on the label. You would do that for yourself, wouldn't you? Okay. Now we're gonna get to, well, first of all, let me ask you something. This is a part of how, how we're gonna learn more and more during these uh, 12 hours of class we're gonna have. What is the same about all of these medications, other than the fact they're pain pills of a sort, and other than the fact that several of them are sinus medicines? What else is similar in those? They're over the counter. Over the counter. That's a good answer. Pre-measured. They're pre-measured. They may have aspirin in them. Does Tylenol have aspirin in it? No, it doesn't. Some sort of tablet. They're on a tablet. But she was getting close to the answer. They all, what they, have they all have Tylenol in them. They all have Tylenol in them. You remember the, the uh, what's going on in the media about Tylenol? You hear it now and again. Tylenol, it's not any good. People are getting sick. People are overdosing. The reason is because it's in every one of these medications. But you don't know that, do you? Now, if you read the label, you would know it. Hmm? Yes. Okay, well, you're right. There's a lot of big words on the label, but there's a lot of regular words on the label. And Tylenol, for many years now, they have been highlighting acetaminophen on the label. So that you, they had to start doing that because of overdoses. Okay, so let's say you have a headache and you take a Goodies. Goodies has aspirin, Tylenol, and you know what the third ingredient is? No, aspirin, Tylenol, and caffeine. That's why you <laughs> like it. The same thing, it's exactly the same, really, but I have to get those two labels together to be able to say that word exactly. But, and I'm not talking about migraine, just Excedrin, regular. They're the same ingredients, Gideon and Excedrin. Excedrin, its third ingredient is caffeine. It's generally aspirin, Tylenol, and caffeine. Now, if they also will have an Excedrin that's aspirin-free, because some people can't take aspirin, so they'll have aspirin-free Excedrin. Well, then it's just Tylenol and caffeine. Now, you like <coughs> goodies, and BC is the other one people like, because they're powdered and they will dissolve quicker, so they get into your system quicker. I need to look up this before I ever teach another class because I need, I keep forgetting when I get home. But you can look it up too when you're in the store. Look it up. BC, I bet you has caffeine too, but I don't know that. But uh, anyway, uh, but the differences, the similarities of these are all the Tylenol. Uh, so you actually, Oh, and I also want to tell you, have you seen Goodies has Goody Shots now? It's called Goody no. Shots. And it is a little liquid bottle of Goodies with a little cap on top. That, that's the cap, and you, 
you put it in that shot. Now, what you know why you like that? Because it's a liquid. It's already dissolved. So it then goes into your system quicker. If you don't learn much else, you learn to look at labels. Go, it's actually kind of a good Friday night event. Go through and look at everything on the shelf. How does it compare? What is Kroger's pain medicine that's like Tylenol? How is that compared to Tylenol? And you will find, generically, many things are totally the same. And if they're totally the same, they should work the same. If they don't, if you need a little caffeine, then drink a little coffee. It's a third of the amount of caffeine that's in a cup of coffee. It's about 100 milligrams of caffeine in coffee, 30 milligrams in goodies. So it doesn't even require. And do you know that the five hour, what's that one well, called? Yeah. Energy? Only has enough caffeine for two cups of coffee. All you need is a couple of cups in the afternoon. You don't have to get that five hour. Tastes better. Hmm? Tastes better? If you're not a coffee drinker, it probably does. If you're a coffee drinker, you don't want to miss your coffee. Okay, let's get started. Now here we are, just getting started. But let's get started. I know you think that this is kind of a drag, but I think you're going to find out that there's more to it than you realize. The very first lesson, this is how, this is our roadmap for how we're going to proceed for, through this lesson. And I have to tell you, that my friends here on the front row, who like to be on the front row, are gonna find that they have a job to do. They're gonna tell us what page we're on. Because I am terrible about changing the order of the lesson. I think it's in the bad order, so therefore I rearrange it. So periodically, they're gonna have to tell you where we are. But almost everything I say is gonna be in there. So you don't have to take a lot of notes. Don't be <coughs> fanatical about that. And the good news is you're not going to take a state test, so you don't have to worry about passing or not. So just learn. Just sit there and listen and learn. And when you go home between now and next Friday, read what we did and answer your self-test. And read the next two lessons so that when we come together next Friday, it'll be a review. Okay. We're going to talk about who's responsible for the administration of medicine. We're going to talk about standards. And this is really when they began making legislation about medications. And you will, I find that interesting. And there's a few people in this room that are not a lot younger than me. And therefore, you were living in this time too. The purpose of the legislations the legal obligations as, as it relates to neglect and malpractice and regulations pertinent to the medication labeling. So let's get started. I think the first thing I do is probably pretty much right there. Who's responsible? We're on page nine. Physicians, pharmacists, registered nurses, certified medication <coughs> attendants, and now medication techs, as you are. I should have added that. Okay, what do physicians do? They can order the medicine, can't they? Can they dispense it, hand it out? Yes, those are what they give you. Samples? Yes. Word retrieval. Word retrieval. He's on the same level as me. He can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember things like sample either. But I got you there. Okay, so anyway, um, they can dispense it. And can they administer it? Yes, they can give you a shot. They can do all of that. Physicians can do it all. But what about pharmacists? Can pharmacists order it? No, they can't order it. They fill it. They do the dispensing. They order from the big place. Oh, they order the, okay. Now you see, that's why you gotta make statements because, yes. They order it from Mexico, he says. <laughs> they actually bring it into their pharmacy, but they don't order what your resident is going to take or what you're going to take. The physician orders. Can pharmacists, we already said they can dispense, they fill the prescription. Can they administer? They didn't used to be able to administer at all, but now they're getting into the role of administering with flu shots, this uh, shingles vaccine. They started with flu shots. 
And but you know, if you go to Kroger, and I say Kroger because that's one of the few places you can get the shingles vaccine. And if you're 60, you need to have a shingles vaccine because you did have chicken pox. Even if your mom says, I'm not sure you had it, you had it. Everybody around you had it. You couldn't have not had it. And if you've had the chicken pox, you need to get the, flu, the shingles vaccine if you can because you don't want to get shingles. Okay. I always digress. Anyway, um, but when you go to get that vaccine, they'll say, well, let me see if the guy's here who gives them. So not everybody there administers. They have to have training and they have to show that they're competent, but they can do it. Now, you and, certi and certified medications attendants are really the same except for they're certified. And can you order? No. Can you dispense? No. But I'll tell you what you do, because you do dispense. Uh, and, but can you administer? Yes. What you cannot do is dispense. And that's where it's a little tricky here. You cannot take a medication out of their blister pack and put it into every day. Now I know you probably do that. The only way you can do it is if they do it and you monitor it. Because that's saying that you're dispensing from the blister pack to the day, daytime. They're supposed to, because when you do that, don't you put another pill in there too? Yeah, so now you're creating a little packet of pills. It doesn't say who it belongs to. It doesn't say what it is. You've just kind of put that all together there, you the mini, mini pharmacist, as you are. <laughs> and you're not a mini pharmacist. So therefore, it's important that you know that. Now, we do things because we help. Maybe their dexterity is not real good. You don't want to knock the pills all over the floor trying to get it into the daytime. So you are very much assisting. You may be assisting totally, but they're right here and you're training. So you have to know what legally you should be doing. And it is that you're not supposed to be dispensing. Now some of the times that happens, and you, you see it a lot in what you do because you leave them and they take their pills every day. One thing we have to think about is, when can they advance to taking their pills every day from their blister pack? Is that a possibility? How many of them take them every day from their blister pack? How do they take them? From a day timer? Oh, that's the, the little seven day, three time a day pill packs? You have a blister pack. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. And that comes from pharmacists, right? Yeah. Okay, and how many of them take them out of that? Punch it into something. I don't mean take it into their mouth. I mean, you punch it into something. Yeah. See why I have to have you respond to me so we understand each other? Okay. Uh, so you punch it, they punch it into the little cup or the whatever. Okay, so most of them do that. Yeah. Do you put it into one of these seven day a week things at the farm? No. No. Okay, so you're not doing it. Okay, sometimes what I find that it happens is if they're gonna go home or they're gonna go to work and you want them to take with them something they're supposed to take at a certain time, then you need to let them put it into whatever it's gonna be and, it, and get a bottle from the pharmacist and say, would you label this his diphenhydramine that he takes at two o'clock when he's working at Berkshire's? And they will give you a bottle and he can every day punch that one from the blister pack, that unidose, what do y'all call it? So, so if they take it like, say, six medications and they at work, how do they put it? Can they put do they the pharmacist and label it and put it all in one container? They actually, well, they can actually have a blister pack that's strictly for work. Mm -hmm. And it'll just have that time. Uh, and they'll just take all those blister packs, though. Is that how they do it now? They take them all with them? I have a question about that. Okay. Nowadays, the law is so, so picky about their pills. If they get stopped and they have a I know. pills in their pocket and they're packed and don't have a label on that's illegal, right? So they shouldn't be yeah, able to be carrying that around without their label. It's not totally illegal. It's uh, You're supposed to have a prescription for medicines that you carry. Uh, uh, the problem comes more with if it's controlled. And I think you know about controlled. 
but we'll bring that up too. But those are good questions. Um, what do you do for people that go to work? Do any of them take medicines with them? They take their meds before they go and when they get home? No, it's the same as a day at work. Let's say 12 noon, they at work. Okay. So if they had taken it at 1 o'clock, what do you do? They take it what back there? They'll take it to work. So they take the whole month's worth? Okay, so they can take it in a backpack or something and have that package of pills with them? But you, Okay, well that's that's like if they're working in a sheltered workshop, like Sea Barks or, or Evergreens or whatever. Correct? What, what, where do they go where there's a nurse? Yes, Sea Bark and Evergreen have the workshops. Okay, is there another question back here? Okay, they can take the whole thing. When we first started those Unidose blister packs, you just do not know the concern of the staff and saying, we can't let them take all this medicine out of here. It's never going to get back again. And then we won't have it. Well, we've learned that that doesn't happen. They do take it out. They take it out to go home. They bring it back. So mostly it's not a problem. But sometimes, and that's what I'm bringing this up for, is sometimes uh, we're talking about who's responsible. The only thing you're responsible for is monitoring that medication or administering, not dispensing it. So if they're going home and they're not to take the whole thing and you're going to put it in some kind of travel bottle, they need to do it. But it seems like that isn't going on very much, so we're not too concerned. You briefly mentioned control medications. Can yes. they take a blister pack of control medications? Or yes, they can. They can? Yes, but then we'll talk about okay. that. Okay. We'll talk about that. Yes. Okay. I have a situation now. My client is total care and she's blind. Mm -hmm. And I have However, she does live in a home, so am I to do it? What happened? We need to let the people her. She lives at home with her family? She lives at home with her family. So her family is the one that needs you need to work with to, okay. to put her daytimer together. Okay, she doesn't have a daytimer. She just takes a month a day. I mean, she's, we have 24-7, but we are...